Welcome, everyone. I know you're going to be inspired by her story today. In today's lifestyle segment, we have uh, a good friend of mine, Valerie Arbo, who's an empowerment coach for moms who have children with special needs. And we are getting our kids ready for school. Now, this is a lifestyle segment on our channel. And I want to encourage you to subscribe and share with your friends. In this season, we all need to be working together and just being with each other and encouraging. So welcome to the show, Valerie. How are you doing today? Thank you, Linda. It's my pleasure to be here. And I'm doing awesome. Thank you so much for asking. Good, good. So you're a life, uh, sorry, an empowerment coach mm -hmm. and children with special needs. So you have some experiential training with this. Oh, yes. 21 <laughs> years of it. Okay. Would you like to share a bit? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I've been married to Scott for 31 years and we have two children. Our first one was born 21 years ago. Her name is Melody Ann. And there's a story behind why she was named that. Anyway, we were seven years trying to get pregnant. And so when we finally gave up and said, okay, we're not going to be the first parents never to have children. We won't be the last. So the very next month I became pregnant, I had a beautiful pregnancy. We were just like on cloud nine. It was amazing. And that was the closest I'd ever been to God. It was a real spiritual high for me during okay. my pregnancy. And at the end of the pregnancy, we were going to be having a C-section because I'd had fibroid, uh, fibroid surgery in 2000. So that meant I was not going to be able to have a natural birth. So I was already scheduled for a C-section. But what happened was I had an umbilical cord prolapse. I didn't even know that that could happen. So the, I was coughing. I had a very bad chest infection. I was doing a lot of coughing. And so the umbilical cord came out. I didn't realize my waters had broken because oh. I was waiting for the gush, which did not happen. And so that's what came out. I, I knew my baby was breech, so I assumed it was her foot that had come mm -hmm. out. Anyhow, we were in a state of emergency. We got to the hospital. I had an emergency C-section and Melody Ann was born with a heart rate less than 60. She was gray and uh, struggling. So they resuscitated her. And gave her a year to live. Wow. So that was my firstborn. My second born, my husband convinced me that we needed to have another child. Because <laughs> I was not having any more after that traumatic sort of, you know, yeah. introduction into parenthood. Yeah. <clears throat> so my husband had seen a picture of a little boy in his wheelchair. And he was laughing to beat the band. His little sister was beside him. And the two of them were just laughing up a storm. <laughs> and Scott said to me, I want that for Melody Ann. Yeah. So hence our journey started to have child number two. <laughs> so child number two was born three months later. And because Melody Ann basically is dependent for all care, when Ebony was born, she was perfect. She We had another C-section because of my uh, previous right. experience. So when she was born, she had all her fingers and toes and she was doing all the things she was supposed to do. So it took us a while to recognize that this was also a child with special needs. Okay. So by the time they were in grade two, I was recognizing, hmm, they're not getting invited to birthday parties. And there was a little bit of social awkwardness. And then by the time they got to grade five, the end of grade five, we realized there was definitely something up. The grade five teacher said, no, oh, preteen syndrome. I'm like, no, there's more to it than that. Anyway, mm -hmm. they got a diagnosis of ADHD. Okay. And if that wasn't enough, we got a diagnosis last summer of um, high functioning autism. Okay. And I mean, ADHD is, is I don't want to say it's common, but it's more recognized. Yes. Um, there, there's a higher percentage of, of ADHD or ADD, um, which is the, the same. Um, it, it's, it's just, it's just, they're not the hyper- they're not hyper, but still easily distracted. I actually wonder if a lot of us, a lot of us have that. We, we, we joke about it saying this, you know, this shiny object syndrome. <laughs> yeah, don't look out the window when you're trying to work. You know? I do think a lot of us have some part, some degree of, of just being distracted. Yeah. Know? 
So mm-hmm. sometimes that can be hard to recognize, especially if they're not hyper. And if they're just right. easily distracted, it wouldn't be as easily yeah. recognized. Yeah. Um, so just with starting school, um, there's there's a lot of extra. I mean, we're all uh, the kids are nervous. The parents are nervous. The teachers are nervous. How do we do it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Our firstborn is totally dependent for all care. So okay. we're looking at wheelchair. We're looking at G-tube feeds. We're looking at nonverbal. And as I say, totally dependent for everything. So Our how old- is that in school? How did you manage that? In school setting, we live in a, a city where they have schools that are specially designed for children um, that are medically complex, children that have special needs. So Melody Ann went to a elementary school that was just for kids with special needs. So we had children on the spectrum. We had children that were medically fragile. There was actually a child on a ventilator. Oh, wow. Going to school. Yeah. And then they have a high school equivalent to that as well. So we had looked into Melody Ann going to a, a regular school with a classroom that was for children with special needs. And it was interesting. I remember going in to meet with the teacher and just saying, well, you know, we've been doing it because I had actually homeschooled Melody Ann for a year prior to her going to, well, as looking at this school. So we looked in at this school and it was quite interesting. The teacher just stood there. And if I could have picked her mouth up off the floor, I would have. But she was, because I'm saying, oh, well, we've done this with Melody Ann. We've done this with Melody Ann. So we were looking at, you know, creating sentences, writing stories, and just all the things that I had been working with, with Melody Ann and doing math. And this teacher looked at me with eyes that were bigger than uh, hearing headlights. And she was just, I think I just was overwhelming her. She was not used to actually having to do things with a child because often when children are that medically complex or that involved it's almost like they're being babysat at school and so that was one of the things I had to do to advocate for Melody Ann was she's not here to be babysat this is a child that has the ability to learn I want her to be challenged I want her to learn things granted we've going to have to tailor things but she still has the ability to learn and it's so so important to be the advocate yes because we care about our kids more than anyone Absolutely. I I mean, other than God, he created them, but we are their advocate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was a bit of a mission in itself. And the fact that I had to understand my child's needs. And so that would be the first thing I would say to parents that are starting off with school, even whether they're just starting their children in school, but each year, because your children are developing and growing. So their needs are going to be changing as each school year approaches. Even so over summer. That can even exactly. change over summer. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's really prudent to evaluate, okay, what are my child's needs for this upcoming school year? And so as you understand their specific needs, and you might be thinking, oh, well, I know their needs, but you need to be looking as they're growing and developing. And so that that way you can help to be a better advocate for your child because you're working towards getting their needs met. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So how did you go about um, deciding on what kind of school? Well, we really didn't have a whole lot of options, Linda. So Melody Ann is YouTube fed. And when we looked at sending her to a regular school that had a specialized classroom, one of the things we were told was that if, sorry, home care would come in. So we're in, in a city that provide home care into the schools. So home care would go in and give Melody Ann her medications. She has medications three to three times a day, four times a day. So medications were needing to be given at school and her feeds would need to be changed or added to. So we were told that if the assigned home care person were sick or they couldn't fill that position for that day, then it would be up to myself or my husband to go in to the school and give Melody Ann her medications and make sure her feeding was going well. So both of, <laughs> both of us work. And so this was not going to be an option. And so 
after sort of exploring what they had to offer, what they could do. And then also to Melody Annie's total care. So she needs a lift to be able to get her in and out of a wheelchair to be safe so that she's not harming anybody and nobody's harming her. So those were one of the stipulations that I had. And so when we kind of weighed it all up, it was just going to be easier to send her to a school that we're used to dealing with children like her that had total needs, that needed total care. They had the equipment to do everything that needed to be done. They had nurses on staff in the school that were designated to that school that were there all day that could deal with any feeding issues and making sure that Melody Ann got her medications. Right. So emotionally, how do you think it would have been uh, different in each school? Would it have been more difficult in a yes. regular school emotionally? For me? For either of you? Uh, for me, I think it would have been hard. It would have been a lot of me going in and doing a lot of hands-on. This is what I'm anticipating. Showing the staff, this is what we need to do. This is how we do things. This is what Melody Ann is used to. You need to be careful. Melody Ann has um, part of her cerebral palsy is that she flails. So she doesn't mean to hit people, <laughs> but her limbs will flail. She doesn't have as good control over her limbs. And so, you know, educating people, you can't get too close and just be aware that she can hit out. It's not intentional. It is part of who she is and what happens with her. So there would have been a lot, I can imagine, a lot of education around how to handle her, how to approach her, to be talking to her, to let her know what's coming. Because often when people are under total care, people just do things to them without actually letting them know what's coming. Right. If you let someone know what's coming, they are more likely to appreciate and be able to cooperate with you. So for us, for instance, with Melody Ann, Melody Ann, we need you to turn. So we're just going to help you turn. So she will do her best to try and help. Melody Ann, we're about to change you. So I'm going to need you to relax your legs so that we can do what we need to do. And so she's will cooperate with you. Right. But again, people don't, to me, that's common sense. I, I work in healthcare. So for me, that's common sense. But when I see in a school system and no disrespect to anyone, but it's just that sometimes we forget because we get task orientated. We're rushing to do the next thing, whatever the case may be. So sometimes those little things we sometimes forget to do. So just reminding people, have the person, have the child work with you and things will go a lot smoother. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, the GPS in the phone or uh, in the car. And and often it it sounds like the voice is nagging at us, <laughs> but without the voice, I may not know I need to turn right in how many, you know, how many meters or you know, how many miles. And if I don't have that prompt, then I'm in the wrong lane. <laughs> so I'm relating it to that. And it, it makes total sense. If we know what's coming, we can prepare for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, I remember when I had, uh, um, I was, I did home daycare for a few years and, and I had one year, I had five boys who had ADHD. It was like a birthday party with tons of energy every lunch. <laughs> I was like, what do I do <laughs> to keep these little guys busy? And this would have been about grade three. So they're really active You know, they're about eight, um, maybe eight or nine, something like that, but it was busy and it was loud. So I, I made arrangements with the parents and I taught them how to, how to wash and dry dishes. Awesome. They were learning a skill, which made yeah. them feel confident. Uh, they stood in line, they took the dish, they went to the back of the line, they dried it, they put it down and they got another one and they went to back to the back of the line, but having a routine, they just knew and they they were part of the process they were they were getting um they were getting positive feedback their parents loved it actually <laughs> but it was i thought it was better than just kind of sending them outside i mean they they did have that outside running get rid of some energy time but to build up their confidence and learn a new skill and just be part of the household that, yeah that seemed to work too and it was routine a routine is so so important Exactly, exactly. No, and I think that's part of it as well is establishing a routine where some of it, if not all of it, um, can be transferred to school so that children 
our my oldest for sure did better with routines that oh. was how we functioned that was how we were able to get through all the care that she needed prior to her going to school so this is a child that has respiratory issues as well so her morning routine looks something like okay we go in we get her washed washed up we do chest physio we give her a nebulizer we get her in a wheelchair as well as she has the nebulizer that's when she's in the wheelchair we do worship with her we do stretching of her legs we get her feeds we give her, her medication so there was all of this needed to every be done. morning every morning getting ready so that the, when the bus came she was ready to get on the bus so my husband and I had it down to a science let me tell you but we, it needed the two of us yes. to be able to get through all that we needed to do to get her on the bus but the routine was the same. So what we did was uh, during the summer, we would kind of keep that same routine so that it wasn't a shock when September came around. So all year we kept that same routine. So she would be getting up early. So some one time, you know, there would be times one of us would be going to work, but we would just kind of keep the routine so that when it came, as I say, to September, it was not a shock to her, nor was it a shock to us. <laughs> Well, routines are good for us. It's and it's it's good for discipline. It's good for time management. It's good for a lot of reasons. So exactly. you know, when it's good for us, even more so for them. Yeah, yeah. And we were fortunate. And it's it, for a while. I think for maybe a year, maybe two years, the school actually did a uh, a modified school year. So instead of having like two months off in the summertime, they actually had it so that they had a little bit longer, say it's spring break and a Christmas break, okay. but the summer break was maybe three weeks. So it was a shorter break. And I found that was really helpful because it kept the same routine for longer periods of the, of the year, which I thought was amazing. It's just unfortunate they didn't keep up with it, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's I, what. I was talking to a homeschool a parent and she said that they don't you, they don't do a summer break at all they do mm -hmm. six weeks of school and then they take a week off yeah and then six weeks yeah. of school and a week off and they do that all year um mm -hmm. and, and it works for them and it, and it kind of made sense so absolutely and we found it worked really well in our family as well when they did that modified school year yeah so so with um with adhd how did you how did you find your daughter did and and the autist the autism well the youngest one we didn't realize was autistic until they were in grade 11 okay and did, yes, just, the to, end of grade just to clarify you're saying them so yes yes we are um non-binary the youngest is non-binary and so their pronouns are they them so forgive me if i mess up but <laughs> i am trying to honor uh, their pronouns and their sexual identity and uh, how yeah. they present themselves. Thanks, Valerie. I just wanted to clarify that in case it was confusing to anyone who was listening. Yeah, no worries. Thank so, you for pointing that out. Yeah, yeah for no, sure. I, I appreciate you being open and vulnerable with that. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. So our youngest, they have the, the ADHD was what we were dealing with and just trying to understand that. And I was one of those parents, because I'm a type personality, very task oriented. Well, can't you just, can't you just, can't you just do this? Can't you just, and not appreciating all that comes with ADHD. And now that we look back, that we have the autism diagnosis, I can see now why they struggled okay. with the social stuff, with um, friendships, with getting things done, keeping their space tidy. They were a messy eater. They still are a bit of a messy eater. Okay. So all of these things kind of combined, kind of now uh, the penny has dropped and it's just like, oh, so this is why we struggle. This is why we struggle. For the longest time, while they were in our church school, which was very structured, and again, trying to keep routine, they didn't do routine as well as Melody Ann, our oldest. But we tried to kind of keep them on a schedule, tried to kind of have some kind of routine, although it was a bit of a battle sometimes. But the structure of school, getting up and going to school for the, at the same time, having the regular school day and then coming home, getting piano done, getting some homework done. So all of that worked really well. Grade eight was a really tough year. And I'd heard junior high can be rough on girls. And yeah, we were not spared. We were not spared at all. So when we took them out of the church school with all this structure, we put them into a art-centered learning school, which they loved. They're very artsy and they very did creative, really yep. well. 
and they had friends for the first time. They had like two different friend groups. They People knew who they were in the school because during their grade eight um, school year, people were kind of backing off because they knew something was up. And children sometimes are not overly accommodating, and especially girls as they kind of get older. So that's what we experienced. So this was a whole new lease on life for our youngest when they went uh, to, to this school and it was going beautifully. And then unfortunately, they the mental health picture started. And they started hanging with someone that probably wasn't the best for them. And it's really difficult. And then we started to see behaviors like skipping school, lying, and making up excuses for but this was all stuff we had never seen. Okay. So it was a, a difficult, difficult transition for us as parents and then not fully understanding their need. And it was almost like they were showing signs and symptoms of BPD and that um, a favorite person. It's, I forget there's a term for it now, but where you just fixate on one person. And that's what we were seeing. That's what BPD is. Part of it is, is where they, they fixate on one person. So this person is their world. If this person doesn't text them, their world falls apart. If this person okay. doesn't have time for them, their world falls apart okay. and everything else, they just fixate on this one person. So everything that, that they're doing is for this one person. Okay. So this was one of the things that we were seeing with our youngest child. And, yeah. and what does BPD mean? Borderline personality disorder. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So trying to sort of organize our child. For us, what we did was we actually ended up moving them to another school, um, to, an, again, another private school, um, church denomination school, and we actually sent them to a boarding school. But not knowing the autism piece, the, and then also the severity of the mental health piece, they actually got through school, the academic piece of it, because they're very bright. But the social piece wasn't too bad initially, but taking care of themselves and their space. Yeah, we did not see that coming. We did not see that coming at all. So, so this, this would have been the first time she was on her own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was quite the journey, quite the journey. We took time to prepare the school for receiving them with this is what we're dealing with. This is why we're sending them here. We need them to be in a place where they're feeling part of a t uh, of a group feeling supported feeling loved and that somebody's watching out for them and so we explained all that they've been through we shared we were very vulnerable with our journey and shared what was going on and for some of it it was helpful but that, what I found was they didn't always follow through what was challenging was because we weren't there and seeing the other side of where they weren't taking care of their space, where they weren't necessarily taking care of themselves well. And there was obviously a breakdown in communication. So one of the things that I would definitely say is number one, teach your child, depending on the age of the child, obviously it has to be age appropriate self-advocacy. And number mm -hmm. two, you have to be in the school's face. And I know there were days when I woke up and I'm thinking, I don't know if I like myself <laughs> because I was, on the phone, sending emails at the school, trying to advocate for my child. And so that is something, it's just that mama bear instinct. And sometimes right. you just have to do it because at the end of the day, as you said earlier, Linda, we love our children aside from God. We love our children the most. We want what's best for them. We know them the best and we know what will work for them. Yeah. So, yeah. So those are a couple of things that I would definitely encourage moms, parents, dads, to make sure that they're teaching their children self-advocacy. And that was something that we did with our youngest when they were in even grade school, um, like elementary school, they would come home and say that the teacher, this, that, and the other. So we taught them, you need to be respectful, but you need to be able to talk to your teacher and let them know what the issue is, what the problem is that you're, that you're experiencing, but you need to be respectful. And to, and, teach, so them, and to teach them age, confidence in themselves who they are. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And even if they don't get the outcome that they want, just acknowledging that they have done some self advocacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, being the being the advocate is is it's difficult when when everyone's wanting a different plan. <laughs> that that can be difficult. Um, it just I, I'm thinking of when. Um, in grade two, uh, my son was had a whole year of having mono. 
Mm. Well, no one had heard of mono in grade, or this was grade two. So like, yeah. you know, teenagers get mono, not little right. kids, but he he was sleeping most of the year he was sleeping literally. So he'd fall asleep in the, in his desk and he, and like, he can't learn like that. But they, the school wanted to send him to grade three when he'd learned nothing. So that would have, that would have just set him up for a lot of heartache and a lot of challenges for grade three to have to learn mm -hmm. grade two and three at the same time. Yeah. And I, I just thought that wasn't very fair really. Mm -hmm. um, so I started advocating to, to keep him back. And this was, this was during a time where the schools were like, they didn't keep anybody back. Everybody mm -hmm. was passed on to the next grade. Didn't matter what you did, you got passed on. And I had to fight, you know, the, the, the principal of everybody. And it was a, it was a tough time. And like, I'm, I'm second guessing myself and, and I hope this is okay. And I'm making a right decision. And yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was hard, um, yeah. but advocating. And then um, just like, again, preparing for this next school year. So he would have gone into that school year knowing he's with the kids that are a year younger mm -hmm. and nervous. So I invited the teacher to come over. Oh, cool. And she did. She, she came over for coffee with her kids about a week before school started. And I, I mean, that was like way over the top of what she needed to do ever, mm -hmm. but it was so fun. Um, we had a really good time. It helped me or it helped us to get to know each other because we're working together. Yes. And it helped my son to know he had a, he had a familiar face that was friendly. Yeah. Yeah. When he went to school and it, it, it just helped him. His whole year was just completely different and he did really well. So just doing whatever we can to help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. And just kind of preparing the children for what's coming. Uh, social stories is something. And so you were actually able to live yours out. <laughs> this is your teacher. You don't need to show a picture. This is your teacher. <laughs> this is what you did. This is your teacher. She drinks yeah. coffee. <laughs> yeah. She's just yeah. like your mom. <laughs> yeah. But how important it is to, to reach out. And I loved how you said, you know, being part of the team. Yes. Sometimes it's it can feel like us and them yes. when you're advocating for your child. And so one of the things that I always do and have always done is we're a team. We are working together. We need to all be on the same page. And we're, we're not here to you know, undermine anything. We want to support you as we're hoping you will support us. So this needs to be, we all need to be on the same playing field and just making sure that the teachers understand that the principals understand that and anybody else that's supporting your child in the school that we're all working together. Well, and there's so many, I'm thinking of so many different degrees of, of special needs. There's so many, um, you know, like Melody Ann, and then there's the the whole spectrum of down to just the, the kids who are just anxious and depressed and their parents mm -hmm. split up this summer. And there's a lot going on at, and in the home, you know, or, uh, well, just all, all different um, variations of home life can be yeah. hard. It can be hard for all of us, but for especially for little kids who don't have an understanding of what's actually happening they're just, they're just in their home. But if they're going back and forth to different parents, that's, right. that, that's juggling. That's, that's a different emotional special need, you yeah. know, or it could be that I had a, you know, again, when I did um, daycare, there was, there was a couple of the kids, a um, couple of the boys again, that got bullied. And mm -hmm. I mean, daily, they would get beat daily. And they would come to me and I'm just like, why don't you tell the principal? And well, nothing happens when I tell the principal. So they, they tell me about it. And I like, it was hard, but mm -hmm. again, if we can be the advocate and get the kids with like, to teach them confidence in who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so important to have a safe person or a safe place to be and yeah. just the, getting them ready for the next, the next year. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking too about transition process. And I think sometimes we forget this piece, evaluating what happened at the end of the previous year. Yes. And then creating plans from that place, taking into account that our children are growing and developing so that we can make effective plans 
for when they start school the next year. Right. Well, and, and sometimes school doesn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. Like, like we're, you know, we're this this is different than special needs, but it, it is, you know, finding that safe person in that safe place. Sometimes mm -hmm. school hasn't been safe. Right. So it, it's important as parents to really listen to what our kids are saying and listen to what they're not saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for kind sure. Hearing between the lines type of thing. But yeah. yeah. And this comes down to preparing your child. So that's one of the other points that I have here. Um, preparing your child, like you say, creating that safe space, creating that safe person where they feel that they can share if they need to share. And that might be meeting with the teacher and just asking them, depending on obviously the abilities of your child, cognitively and physically, is there a buddy or a mentor that we can kind of hook them up with? So, you know, as you did with your child, the teacher came over, met some of the kids. And so is that something that can happen over the school year? Oh, sorry, over the summer, so that your child has that familiar face, especially if they're starting a new school. And another thing, when I think about preparing the child is preparing the teacher as you did, but also things like an all about me book. That's one of the things that I did. Okay. I have an all about me book for Melody Ann. So it talks about her family, talks about her, what happened to her, who are the main people are in her life, her medical team. I think I had that in there. I had the things that she likes, how she does things, how she needs to sit properly in a wheelchair, how she communicates. So I had all of this in a binder so that that was there at the school. And I know some other moms that have actually gone into the school, especially if it's a new teacher, new classroom, new school, and asked to do a presentation for oh, the kids. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so that they can talk about their child and introduce their child. And this is how we communicate. These are what some of the things that they love. Again, and having the child, depending on their ability, be part of that as well. So almost showcasing, but then it just kind of takes that fear away or that, oh, I'm not so sure that, you know, anxiety, but it just gives everyone an opportunity to get to meet that child. Because you know how it is sometimes, you know, kids go to school and they're a little bit shy or there's something that's different about them and everybody kind of overlooks them. But this way, it just kind of puts the spotlight on them. Right. I, um, and you've probably seen um, where they have a, a group of people that are all completely different. And they'll say, who likes to or let's see um, who, who comes from a broken family? Or who who ha, who who grew up in a on in on a farm, or who who likes to garden, or who likes to read, and and it and it, it connects people who have common things, yeah, instead Similar of separating interests. people with division to to mm -hmm. find things what they have in common. So by explaining what our kids enjoy and what they're interested in, it's it gives yeah. them an opportunity to connect with other with other people. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. That that's great. That's great. Well, was there anything else that you'd like to share in particular, Valerie, that well, would be an encouragement for some other moms? Yeah. Um, just, and most people that have children with special needs, you know, about the IEP. So the individual education program, but just one of the things I would Ca not caution, but um, encourage parents to do is to be really specific with that, really specific. One of the things we didn't understand until later was with our youngest, their need for sensory accommodation, because we weren't, we didn't realize that they were on the spectrum. So they have mm -hmm. sensory accommodations that they need. And so just being really specific with each of the needs and accommodations that you may need, just making sure that the teachers are going to be addressing those. And so, because at the end of the day, we want our children to have a great school experience, right? Okay. So I think another thing to mention, Linda, is self-care. A lot of us can be mama bears and we're just mm -hmm. running to get this organized, that organized, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves because if we're not taking care of ourselves, we can't sustain what it takes to look after our children, to be that advocate, to be making sure that things are the way they're supposed to be, that our children are getting the education and the support and everything that they need. So we really do need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. And that means that we're eating well, 
that we're sleeping well, that we're drinking enough, that we're exercising, that we're taking time out for ourselves, having a little bit of me time. I used to call them, I used to call them, mommy needs a time out. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> and that might have been only five minutes, but I just needed to. Yeah. And then that way I can approach whatever's coming at me from a more calm place. So it really is important to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Make sure you're scheduling that self-care. And for some people, it might be taking a walk. It might be reading a book. It might be just sitting with your feet up and having a cup of tea, calling a friend, talking to a family member, but make sure you take some time out for you. Yeah, that's so important. Um, we had a, a routine of, of after supper, walking the kids around the block and it and it kind of brought the day down. Yeah. But it was it was still... I got my walk, the kids got their walk, but they were, they were busy, but it was, it was a, it was a downtime. So it was a good, that was part of our routine at the end of the day, but yeah. So thank you so much, Valerie, for sharing these really good ideas. Um, as an empowerment coach, um, I'm sure you're able to, to help a lot of moms uh, as they maneuver through the challenges of, of, just being a parent because we, we do the best we can. We really, exactly. do. everybody is doing the best they can. Um, so I just, and, and for the, for today's, uh, today's uh, viewers, I'm so glad you were able to join us in the lifestyle segment. I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel and share it with your friends. Mm -hmm. um, we, it's just an opportunity to encourage each other and we can be inspired by her story. So thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now.